What's up, everyone? I'm Thomas J. Beleza. Welcome to The Right Mindset. Now, a first act is the make or break moment that gives your readers a chance to connect within those first few chapters. Today's lesson, crafting a captivating first act, essential first act techniques using the 27 chapter outline. <clears throat> now, whether you're going with the original 27 chapter outline and want to get readers to connect with your characters and the narrative within the first nine chapters, or you're taking a more loose approach with the 27 point outline, today we're going to go over the needs of your first act. Now, these will be elements that are essential for making a strong first act to elevate the connection with your audience and bring characters to life in a way that will allow them to lead your readers into the second act. Oh, yeah. Now, why is this important? That's a good question. Understanding the intricacies of the first act is paramount for any storyteller. Now, the opening chapters of your narrative serve as the cornerstone upon which the entire story is built. A well-crafted first act not only captivates your audience from the uh, outset, but also lays the groundwork for character development and the unfolding plot. It's in these initial chapters that readers form their emotional bonds with the characters becoming invested in their journeys and the challenges they face. By mastering the elements essential for a first act, you ensure that your story has the solid foundation needed to keep readers engaged and eager to follow your characters into the heart of the narrative. You know, so we're going to be diving into those principles. And just a, a, a little upfront information is that basically the first act is the setup. As per the 27 chapter outline, or if you're using the more loose version uh, that I kind of molded and, malle uh, and turned into a, a, a malleable uh, approach to the outlining process called the 27 plot point outline, you will see that it is called act one setup, right? And this is all the setup and we're going to go over all the information, but ultimately it's where your characters are presented, their motivations, their ordinary world, uh, what the potential threat is, you know, uh, the rules of your world, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter if it's romance or otherwise, uh, act one is ultimately preparing the audience or the reader with the essential information to be challenged in the second act. Now, the objectives for this lesson uh, is hopefully by the end of it, uh, you will grasp the role of the first act. You will be able to identify essential elements. You will be able to analyze effective first acts. You'll be able to apply structure to your own writing. And uh, you'll be able to look at the 27 chapter slash plot point outline and adapt it to your needs. And um, hopefully it'll engage creatively, uh, creatively with the story's beginning, meaning you'll get to play with it, not, not approaching it in, this is supposed to be just informative, but adding some story to your narrative. And remember, the right mindset here, we define a narrative as plot and story. Plot is what needs to happen. Story is how it unfolds. Okay, let's do it. Quick overview of Act One. <clears throat> if you haven't already, Act One focuses on setting up the story's world, characters, and initial conflict, laying the foundation for the narrative journey. Act One is basically designed to draw readers into the story, introduce the main characters, establish the setting, and present the initial conflict or quote-unquote inciting incident that propels the narrative forward. It sets the tone, mood, uh, your writer's voice, and the expectations for the rest of the story. Now, Act 1 ends with the protagonist fully engaged with the conflict introduced by the inciting incident and basically having faced initial challenges and made significant decisions that set the stage for the deeper exploration and escalation of the narrative in Act 2. So again, Act 1 ends with the protagonist fully engaged with the conflict that was introduced through the inciting incident. They had faced initial challenges and made significant decisions 
that ultimately set the stage for the deeper exploration and escalation of the narrative in Act Two. Now, the structure provided uh, here. Let me let me get that going. Boop. Okay. Beep. All right. So this structure right here uh, basically explains what sections will be in Act One set up and ultimately what their purpose is. So section one is setting up the ordinary world, okay? And section two is a problem disrupts the protagonist's life. And section three, the protagonist's life changes direction. So let's look at how each section has a purpose. Section one, known as setting up the ordinary world, this, the objective of this section is to introduce the protagonist and their normal world before the central conflict disrupt, disrupts it. Basically, what is their life? Um, basically, what is their life before that disruption comes, before that inciting incident hits? You want to show their life however it is. And by the way, their life could be as intricate as being within the war itself. So if it is a, a, a lot of people might think the war or a war is the inciting incident, but the characters could already be within that inciting incident. And I've used the example of Saving Private Ryan in the past, where the first scene, the ordinary world of that movie, just for a visual, I, I know it's not a book, but just for a visual, Saving Private Ryan shows you the storming of Normandy, right? The beach scene. And it shows like the viciousness of war and it's setting up the tones and the themes, right? Of act one. And then the inciting incident is ultimately when Tom Hanks's character is informed, uh, or more importantly, the inciting incident is that, uh, um, uh, private Ryan's brothers were, uh, spoiler killed. And now what's the response to that? Well, Tom Hanks's character and his, his people have to go, uh, save him. So now the ordinary world that's set up in section one is that we see how violent the world is and how vicious the war is and that it's been going on. Uh, the inciting incident is ultimately people people died, the two brothers informing the audience of the rules uh, that we have to get Save and Private right out of there because he's the last surviving brother. And then the reaction to the inciting incident is that they have to go uh, save him, right? And that's section one that sets it up, right? So you have to look at it like that. So introduce the protagonist and um, the normal world before the conflict. Now keep in mind, section two, a problem disrupts the protagonist's life. The objective of this, of this moment is to deepen the conflict introduced by the inciting incident, further complicating the protagonist's situation and forcing them to engage more directly with the emerging narrative. So this section takes, uh, takes whatever the inciting incident is and explores it. It jumps into different elements. Uh, you know, for example, it'll, it'll talk about the reaction the protagonist and thinking about the long-term impacts of that inciting incident. Uh, it gets to the moment where they're like, you know what? I have to take action. And then ultimately they do take that action. What is the immediate consequence of them taking action? So you have to look at this section as a challenge to that inciting incident and the information and how it influences the main character, the protagonist, uh, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. It's up to you. It's, it's whatever you want to do. It's your story, right? All right. And then section three, the protagonist's life changes a direction. Okay. Now the object or the objective of this is to conclude act one with a significant development or twist, uh, quote unquote, or pinch that fully commits the protagonist to their new path, leaving their ordinary world behind. Okay. Sounds exciting, right? Well, this is uh this is where you would look at the protagonist's life changes as a result and whatever the their actions did and the consequence of those actions and therefore the inciting incident becoming something that they're dealing with directly it adds pressure and stress to their life and it could be 
uh, something as crazy as they are going into have to find this person. And there's a time limit on it because they could they could be uh, ended, you know, Um or it could be a romance. It could be, you know, we've talked about that in other other videos where it's just, well, how do I approach a situation? Do I really like him or her? You know, uh, should I really approach? Should I keep going forward and see where this goes or should I be hesitant on it? Right. That's the pressure element. OK. And then, of course, within Section three, you're also dealing with the first plot point or um, first plot twist or pinch. And this will change things. It'll make you see it differently. And then because of that twist, the character will ultimately be pushed into the new world. Now, um, let's talk about some uh, tips. OK, uh, these are three. We're going to do three strong tips. Uh, the first one is establish clear character motivations and stakes. So when you're looking at your first act, OK, this is the first act as total. Or this would be the nine plot points you want to say to yourself. How do I understand my characters better and how do I set clear stakes? OK, so spending time. All right. Uh, spending time developing a deep understanding of your main characters establish and ultimately establish the protagonist. You want to know their desires, fears, strengths, and weaknesses. This understanding will inform their reactions to the inciting incident and the challenges ahead of them. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to, but you can. You don't have to write out a list of like what's their favorite colors, you know, uh, what's their what, what was their uh, history when they were five. Like you don't have to, but you're more than welcome to. My advice is to do whatever you need to do as a writer, as an author, to understand your characters. And everybody's technique is different. So whatever you feel you need to do to best understand your characters. And the reason you want to understand your characters is because that creates their positions. And then you could challenge their positions. And then based on that challenge, they will completely change, slightly change, or not change at all. And, main, and that position will be influenced by those three elements. If their position doesn't change at all, they continue forward as is. If it slightly changes, that changes their behavior a little bit. If it completely changes, that changes their behavior drastically, in a sense, especially depending on whatever the position is. I mean, if it's like, do you like diet uh, cherry Pepsi? Or you like uh, cherry Coke? And someone's like, hey, I like Diet Cherry Pepsi. And they're like, just try this Cherry Coke. And you're like, I've never tried it. I'm not interested. I'm a Pepsi person. And like, just try it. And you're like, fine. You drink it. And you're like, oh, you know, this is good. Like, that's not going to drastically change the character. But it is a changed position, especially if they're like, you know what? This is better than Diet Cherry Pepsi, whatever the case may be, right? But you do want to understand your characters enough. So when you're making choices for them on the page or... If uh, your characters speak through you and you feel that they are making choices and you're just the conduit which in, in which you write it, you understand why they're making those choices. Now, ultimately, the more you understand your characters, the easier it is to figure out where will they go and how will they react. However, remember, every book is written through drafts. So your zero draft is the discovery. Your first draft is the cleanup. Uh, your second draft is taking notes from your bit, your alpha readers, et cetera, et cetera. However, through each process, you might realize that, wait, I think I'm finding my character's voice. And that might mean you have to go back and kind of sort of like reinterpret their choices or investigate them and see if they have been consistent. OK, now this, the clear stakes. You want to ensure that the stakes are clear and personal for the protagonist from the beginning. You know, what do they stand to gain or lose by doing whatever it is they have to do? Uh, what is their ordinary world? And basically explaining what their, you know, who they are and their values. Because then when the inciting incident comes, what do they stand to gain or lose? All right. By getting involved. If they don't get involved, what will they lose? If they do get involved, what will they gain? Right. The stakes should be significant enough to justify the protagonist's decisions and actions throughout the act. This creates investment from the audience, your readers, as they understand what's at risk and root for the protagonist to succeed. All right. Uh, number two, 
craft a compelling, inciting incident. Now, you want to make it impactful, and you also want to ensure its relevance. Let's examine the first one. Make it impactful. The inciting incident is the catalyst for your story, so it needs to be compelling. It should disrupt the protagonist's world in a way that cannot be ignored, forcing them to act. This doesn't necessarily mean it has to be dramatic or explosive. Even a subtle event can have profound implications for a well-drawn-out character, something that challenges their moral compass or challenges status quo or their stagnant life or the way they look at things. Um, this is usually why you'll see in stories, especially older stories, where there's a male character and the, the female character passes away. Like something happens to her and what does it do? It compels them forward. The most recent version of this that I, I can recall is John Wick. And, you know, basically he has a happy, great life. And she's not necessarily like somebody takes her away, but she passes away and he's in misery. He's depressed. And then the last, oh, spoiler, the last bit of uh, decency in his soul is this puppy that's given to him. And someone comes and they take his car and unfortunately say goodbye to the puppy. And John Wick takes action, right? So that's like a dramatically drastic thing, but it changes their world and, you know, they're pushed into it. But you could have smaller moral moments. You could have moments where, like, you know, meet meet the Fockers, you know, uh, with Ben Stiller. That's very old, right? Uh, there's a wedding coming up and uh, that's the inciting incident. <laughs> We got to go to my sister's wedding uh, and you're going to meet my parents. Oh, oh, OK. Well, I love this person. Uh, I'm going to go with them, but I'm also going to ask her to marry me. So I have to get the parents to like me. And uh, so, you know, this is going to be my chance. There's nothing too dramatic about that or explosive, but it is profound enough for the character to be like, all right, I have to do this. I'm about to go into a world. I don't know. And that leads me to the ensure its relevance. All right. So the inciting incident should be directly related to the core conflict of your story and tied to the protagonist's arc. It should challenge them in a way that exposes their flaws, desires, or fears, setting up the transform transformative journey, which again, if we look at Meet the Faulkners, or I should say Meet the Parents. I'm so sorry. It's the first movie. So many. There's so many of them. Uh, the first movie, Meet the Parents, uh, the flaws, desires, and fears. So the flaws is he's a male nurse, right? And that becomes like a punch, a punchline in the whole thing, right? He's right, but his desire is to show that he is good enough for the daughter, and he wants to make a great impression. So his fear is that he will come out looking not so good, and then he makes a whole bunch of bad decisions, from hiding that he's smoking a cigarette to uh, the whole milking. You know, he went along with a story where he's like, I milked the cat, you know, and, and, you know well, I have nipples, Greg's. Can you milk me? Right. To uh, to a whole <laughs> everything in that movie is ultimately he's afraid that he's going to look bad and he ends up becoming worse because, you know, his fear is making him make poor choices. Anyway. All right. Tip number three. Balance world building with narrative momentum. Now, the two things you should understand is integrate world building seamlessly, and I'll explain that, and maintain forward momentum, okay? Before I actually uh, read my notes, the seamless element of world building, and again, you could do whatever you want. You are the author or writer. My suggestion is that to make it seamless, allow it to move through the narrative experience, so allow world building to be important to the character's experience. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be uh, push the story forward, though that that is the second element that is also important. However, if it's not going to directly push the plot forward or create momentum, allow it to be through the experience of the narrative or the characters involved. What does that mean? If a character enters a castle, and you as the writer want the audience to know how beautiful the castle is and all its intricacies, there's a difference between stopping the narrative 
and describing that versus allowing the character to move through the story, the narrative, and as they enter different rooms or uh, they interact with things within the, the castle, you describe them. So going through the door, you can describe the door. Looking at the high ceilings as they enter a massive room, which might be them out of water, right? They're they're a fish out of water. They're maybe they uh, don't come from this kind of wealth, right? Um, maybe if they enter the throne room, they might be at awe. What's going on? Maybe they're uh, they're nervous or they have a sub self consciousness, so they're looking at their feet while they walk, which means they are more or less looking at the floor and the stonework, and not necessarily the ceiling or the walls or the tapestry. So allow the world building to work through the experience of your character and the narrative. And when I say narrative, it means if a character is, say, out in the fields and someone goes, we should go uh, meet the king, as, as an example, you don't stop the narrative and say, let's describe the castle. Let's go meet the king. Because did you know that the castle was built in 1900 something? And it has this, 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 this. And did you know this is the fourth king? Like, that's not working through the seamless. And that's, again, just my advice, but you could do whatever you want. I'm just suggesting allow it to move through the experience of the narrative and the characters. Now, to maintain the forward movement as a secondary element to balancing world building with narrative momentum, even as you're setting up the world and characters, keep the story moving forward. Each scene should serve a purpose, whether it's revealing character, advancing the plot, or setting up future conflicts. The end of Act 1 should feel like a natural escalation from the beginning with a clear direction for the story to proceed. I say this often in my videos. Every sentence, again, this is my uh, opinion, my approach, and things that I've learned, but you are the author writer, so you can do whatever you want. It's just an option, one of many hundreds of thousands of ways to write a book. I try to make sure that every sentence has one or more of these three elements, either plot, character development, or world building, or some variation of two or three of those elements. And that helps keep the momentum going. And that allows you to describe things through the character development, meaning their experience. It helps the narrative push the story forward uh, uh, through the plot. And of course, the world building element, if presented in a good pro, uh, is through the experience of a narrative or a character. Um, ultimately, by focusing on these areas, uh, you as the writer can create a first act that not only sets up your story effectively, but also hooks readers and keeps them engaged. Yeah. Uh, we got a little bit more, but uh, if you've gotten to this point and you love what you're hearing and you want to hear more and you want to stay in tune, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Let's go through the... Um, we're going to do a walkthrough, all right? Do, do, do. A do, do, do. Boop. All right. Okay. Section one. Here we go. All right. So, as you can see, this is act one, the setup, right? And we're going to be focusing on first act one, section one, setting up the ordinary world, which again, real quick, is... Uh, the ordinary world before the disruption, the inciting incident, and then plot point three, the protagonist reacts to the inciting incident, okay? Uh, the ordinary world before the disruption, keep in mind the purpose, as you can see on the screen, so please pause and take notes if you want. I'm basically going to just read through it, uh, just so if you're listening and, uh, you know, you want to come back to it later. The purpose of the ordinary world before the disruption which is known as the introductions, is to establish the protagonist's baseline where they start emotionally, physically, and geographically before the story's main events unfold. Oh, soda. All right. Now, key elements, as you can see, are character introductions, setting the scene, and hinting at the protagonist's desires, fears, and flaws. An example uh, of this uh, structure is Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Spoiler alert. Um, as you can see, the main character, Robin, uh, Robert, Robert is introduced as a Harvard symbologist, which, if I remember correctly, was actually just a term made up. 
but I, I could be wrong uh, for the book, but I, it might actually be a thing. I don't know. Um, that was an aside. I'm sorry. Robert is introduced at Harvard as a symbologist uh, uh, in Paris for a lecture representing his normal life before the story events. Very simple, very straightforward. Um, by the way, this this uh, this thing we're looking at. Um, so that this what we're going to go over will be in a folder, uh, a Google Docs folder, and the link is going to be in the comments and also the description of the video. It's all free. You don't have to sign up for anything. You just literally click on the link and then you can download all the files that are in there. I add to it occasionally and I also update and adjust files that are in there. And it's just everything that I go over basically when it comes to uh, the sheets and stuff like that is there from the 27 uh, plot point outline to treatments like how to, you know, how to write a TV or a film treatment, et cetera, et cetera. All right, let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. All right, let's look at. Oh, um, OK, so let's look at uh, the second thing, which is the, the inciting incident. The inciting incident, the purpose to this is to introduce an event that changes the protagonist's world, presents them with a new challenge or goal. Now, the key elements to hear is that the event should be significant and compelling enough to disrupt the ordinary world and push the protagonist toward action. Now, the example here brings us back to the Da Vinci Code. And what do we notice? We own us that we we own us. I have dyslexia, so uh, forgive me. Uh, Langdon is awakened by a phone call and summoned. All right. And basically, uh, we find, uh, you know, he finds that the museum curator is uh, not doing well. He's not breathing anymore. And it's a mysterious manner that uh, that happened. OK, I don't want to say certain words. I don't want to get anyone upset. Uh, which is always important. We have to have empathy for people and we have to uh, relate. But uh, you can see the dialogue there. So this brings us to the third plot point within Act 1, which is the protagonist reacts to the inciting incident. The purpose of this is to showcase the protagonist's initial reaction to the inciting incident, highlighting their emotional and practical response to new challenge. Key elements would include the protagonist's emotional state, the immediate repercussions of the inciting incident, and the first hint of how it might change their path. Okay, basically, what that seeding is um, that element, the pro the uh, the hint of how it might change their path, will lead into plot point four, which is the reflections of the long term impacts and the inciting incident. So this sort of sets the seed for that debate uh either be it uh mentally emotionally physically spiritually whatever all right now continuing uh oh so the dan brown element uh is that he uh he becomes the suspect himself you know and they're like hey and he's like yo and then they arrive and reveals a hidden message oh that is left there for lang langland himself and uh, and he's the one who could ultimately decipher it, huh? Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? All right. Section two. Dude, 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 dude. Okay, let's. Boop. Okay. Section two. Section two. All right. Uh, the problem disrupts the protagonist's life. All right. And this takes up plot point four, five, and six. And on that, now. Just for the record, the object, the objective for section two, a problem disrupts the protagonist's life is to deepen the conflict introduced by the inciting incident, further complicating the protagonist's situation and forcing them to engage more directly with the emerging narrative. That is why number four, plot point four, is the protagonist reacts to the uh, reacts to and reflects on the long term impacts of the inciting incident, also known as the reaction. As you can see, the purpose is to explore the broader implications of the inciting incident on the protagonist's life and their understanding of the world. Key elements that you want to pay attention to is the protagonist's internal and external conflicts, their reflection on the changes, and the beginning of their transformation. And if you continue to look at Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, 
uh, Langdon and Sophia decipher of the message, right? And this leads them to believe that his his ending is part of a larger mystery connected to the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail. All right. Uh, okay. Plot point five. The protagonist decides to take action, also known as action. The, protag the purpose of this is to mark the protagonist's this transition from reactive to active, making a dec decisive uh, uh, move that uh, indicates their uh, commitment to resolve the conflict. Key elements to keep in mind is a clear uh, decision point for the protagonist, setting the stage for the challenges ahead. And the example for the Dan Brown, as you can see, is they decide to investigate further following clues, which will ultimately lead them to Leonardo da Vinci's work. And that brings us to plot point six, the immediate consequences of action taken by the protagonist. So in this case, Dan Brown is like, hey, we're going to do this. And Sophia's like, yeah, let's do this. And it's going to lead them to the to the uh, da Vinci's work. Right. So. Now there's immediate consequence to that, also known as consequence. The purpose is to show the immediate outcomes of the protagonist's decision to take action, whether positive or negative, and set up for the conflicts. Remember, consequence can be either positive or negative. Key elements, the first hurdles or obstacles faced as a direct result of the protagonist's action, foreshadowing the challenges to come. If you're looking at the Dan Brown element, their investigation makes them targets of both the police and the Opus Dei monk. Uh, and basically, uh, that monk is acting on behalf of the shadowy figure known as the teacher. Dun, dun, dun. Let's move on. Section three, the last three plot points. Now, this is. This is going to be uh, the protagonist's life changes direction, okay? And the objective of Section 3 is to conclude Act 1 with a significant development or twist that fully commits the protagonist to their new path, leaving their ordinary world. So let's look at that. Plot point 7, anyone? The protagonist's life changes as a result of the action they took and creates pressure and stress, also known as pressure. Dum, 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 dum. Pressure. The purpose of this is to escalate the tension and stakes, showing the protagonist beginning to feel the weight of their decisions. Now, key elements to keep in mind is the growing pressure from the challenges faced, the stress of the unknown, and the protagonist's determination despite adversity. If we look at Dan Brown, the example here, what is the stress? Well, as they follow the trail of clues, the danger increases and the mystery deepens, revealing a conflict between a whole bunch of people over the truth and nature of the Holy Grail. All right, which brings us to plot point eight. First twist or plot or pinch happens, also known as plot twist. Now, keep in mind, I always say this. I say this often, but a plot twist doesn't have to be a dun 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 okay it's just something that wasn't expected or subverts your expectation whereas a pinch is something that kind of moves moves the story a little uh, gives a little bit more uh, right and also makes the character feel it they feel it they feel that whatever's happening is happening and they're like all right i feel the pressure which is why uh, it pushes you Number nine pushes you into the real world because it's like, whoa, this is, uh, yeah, I got to take some action here, all right? Which brings us to me explaining plot point eight. Uh, the purpose is to introduce a twist or pinch that complicates the story further, testing the protagonist's resolve and pushing the narrative toward act two. Key elements, an unexpected development that raises new questions or introduces new obstacles, altering the protagonist's course. Dan Brown says that in the Da Vinci Code, they discover that the keystone, a crucial item in their quest, is hidden. Oh, now they got to go to Zurich. Son of a. All right, plot point nine. There you go. Plot point nine. Because of that twist, the protagonist is pushed into New World, also known as pushed. 
purpose to transition the protagonist fully into the new world of the story, leaving behind their ordinary world and embracing the journey ahead. They're like, let's do it. We're all in. Key elements is the protagonist has the acceptance. They accept. All right. So the protagonist's acceptance of their new reality and the challenges it presents, marking a point of no return. Dan Brown says, retrieving the keystone, they barely escape and realize that the mystery involves not just historical artifacts, but also a secret that could shake the foundations of Christianity. Now they have to go, right? They're like, we can't turn back. Not only do we have the keystone, but the implications of what this means is drastic, drastic, drastic. What do you think? Anything? Not just me? All right. Quick, listen, you want to practice outlining, right? Unless you're a pantser, then just kind of work on the big, the big points, you know, the, the, uh, the plot points of like, well, I need, I need to know who they are and what they are. I need to disrupt that. And, uh, you know, maybe there's something else involved and, uh, they have to get pushed into the second act. Right. But if you are an outliner or you would like to try outlining, you should also practice all that we went over to help you understand the formula before you get to the stories you want to tell. Practicing only when you write can lead to writer's block, inconsistency, and a slow growth over a curve that isn't being honed. You want to allow yourself a chance to take simple stories and break them down through each step of the process so you can build the muscle of creativity. Now, all I'm trying to say here is instead of only practicing when you write your books, Take time to work on smaller ideas or ideas that aren't even important and just break down how it would look. Maybe take the story that you are working on and try alternative approaches to that narrative and just break it down within the plot points themselves. Um, another thing you could do is look at current stories, either books, television shows, an episode or a movie and break down the 27 plot points. Now with a television show, each episode should technically have 27 plot points. Sometimes they kind of mash together within the first, in, in, a, in a scene. Uh, but you could also look at a series, a season, as the 27 plot points. Like the episodes are those plot points, right? So it, it, you, can, you can break down pretty far. I mean, you could literally take the first act and expand it to 27 plot points. You can do that. As much as you can take the 27 plot points and, exp and shrink it down to a, a first act. You have a lot of leeway with that. You can find where the beats kind of fit and, and, and mix. But my point with the practicing outline is so you can learn and develop the skill of just kind of being able to talk your way through the movement of those plot points. I have some live videos where I do outlining in real time where I just make it up on the spot. And you could see that sometimes it takes me uh, an hour to do, but. I get out all those plot points. You'll see that I make mistakes. You'll see that I realize that, wait, this actually feels more like this kind of plot point. Now I start moving things around and it shows you that it is a process. But the more you do it, the more uh, the more uh, adept you will get or you, you'll, you'll be uh, you'll master it. All right. Question. What ordinary world got you excited in a novel, film or television show? Huh? Now. Uh, before we, before we get to the last couple things, uh, just, uh, just remember that, uh, if you like what you like, please subscribe, hit the bell icon. So you don't miss out a quick reminder. Uh, I have, I, <clears throat> there's one quick thing after this, uh, but, uh, but a quick reminder is I'm going to start trying to do live videos again on Saturdays. Um, you'll see the premiere dates. If you go to the live, the live tab. And I will be doing real-time outlining. Uh, I will do real-time examples. Uh, I'll speak about writing in general, et cetera, et cetera. So the real, the a quick, a quick, quick recap. Today's session on a crafting a captivating first act, we did touch on the following components, all right? Uh, the role of the first act which is we del uh, you, the role of it is to serve as the cornerstone of your narrative, setting the tone, establishing the setting, and introducing the central characters. Number two, uh, the elements for engagement, right? We, uh, we talked about how we can uh, create compelling introductions to the protagonist's world, a uh, clear presentation of stakes, and gripping, inciting incident that propels the narrative. Uh, structure 
for success. Now, through the lens of the 27 chapter outline, we examine how to effectively structure the first act by looking at Dan Brown at the purpose of each se- of each plot point, etc. Uh, so there you go. Final final thoughts. An outline can be more or less, right? So um, reflect on the profound impact these initial co- chapters. Wow. Dyslexia. Reflect on the profound impact these initial chapters have on your story's trajectory and your reader's engagement. Now, the first act is where your narrative takes its first breath, where characters come to life and where the seeds of conflict begin to sprout. It's your opportunity, okay, to invite readers into a world of your making, to make them care deeply about your characters, and to set the stage for the transformative journey ahead. Now remember, a strong first act is more than just a series of events. It's a promise, a promise to your readers, a promise of an adventure, of growth, and of a story worth investing their time and emotions in. As you craft these opening chapters, consider not just the structure and the plot points, but the emotional undercurrents, the thematic questions and the character arcs that will resonate with your audience and keep them turning thy pages. So embrace the process from the meticulous planning of the 27 chapter outline to a creative freedom of adapting it to suit your narrative needs. Each story is unique, and so is the way it unfolds. So allow yourself the flexibility to experiment, to learn from each attempt, and to find the rhythm that best serves your tale. In the end, the journey of storytelling is a blend of art and craft, intuition and technique. Now, as you continue to hone your skills and deepen your understanding of narrative structure, let the lessons from crafting your first act inform not just the beginning of your stories, but their heart and soul as well. So keep these insights close as you venture forth in your writing journey. And remember, every great story starts with a single word, a single idea, and the courage to bring it to life. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Next video in the series, uh, we will break down the purpose of Act 2. We'll basically do what we did here today, but with Act 2 and get you a excited as always you got to keep developing the right mindset i'll see you next time thank you so much much love much happiness and keep that writing journey going